Okay, welcome everyone to my continuation of what is category theory. Today I would like to tell you about initial and terminal objects, um, which is kind of the first step towards the limits. So limit is one of the big concepts of category theory and initial and terminal objects are really cute examples of limits. Um, and if you don't like limits or if you haven't seen limits so far, no worries, we don't need them in this video. Uh, the only thing you need to know is what zero is because zero is great. So zero is absolutely great. We'll see that in this video. I hope everyone here likes zero. By the way, the definition or the observation that there is a zero is pretty recent in the sense of, well, <laughs> humanity, if you want, because a lot of cultures actually never had really a concept of zero. So it's not quite an, as obvious as a concept if, if you, as you might think it is. Anyway, um, so let's get started. So zero, yay. So here's zero. So in one of my favorite categories, it's one of the easiest categories around, k vector spaces. It's kind of rich enough that you can do linear algebra, and it's kind of kind of well behaved enough that it kind of has all the properties you want it to have. So k vector spaces is really, really a nice and cute category. Um, yeah, and it has a zero object. It has a zero k vector space. Then what is so special about zero? There is quite a lot that is special about zero, but let's take the following perspective. On the left-hand side, I will have initial objects. I can already tell you that. And on the right-hand side, I will have terminal objects. And what is so special about zero? Well, for zero, there's exactly one map from zero to k squared. And there's exactly one map from k squared to zero, which is a zero map. And k squared is just a placeholder for any type of vector space x that you could put here. So for there's precisely one map from zero to x. And in the same way, there's precisely one map from x to from x to zero. It's in both cases actually the same map. It's a zero map. It's strictly speaking not the same map because they have different targets and different sources, but it's kind of the same map anyway. Um, if you want, one of them is a is a column zero vector and one of them is a row zero vector. If you want, but anyway, it doesn't really matter. Um, point is, there's exactly this one map, and there's no other map. There's really no other map from zero to x or from x to zero. And no other k vector space actually has this property. As soon as you write down something more fancy, whatever, from k uh, to k squared, you already have kind of a lot of scalars that you can put here. So there's definitely not a unique map from k to k squared. If you want to go from k squared to k squared, you get a whole bunch of matrices and so on. So only zero has this property. There's only one vector space having this property, and that's zero. That makes zero pretty cool. That makes zero very special, right? In the setup, in this setup where we don't multiply numbers, where we just have zero vector spaces, zero is very special in the sense that there's exactly one outgoing map and exactly one incoming map for each associated vector space X. So let's have a look at another example, um, which is not as nicely behaved as vector spaces, this category of sets. So set is, of course, also a relatively easy category. It's not as nice as vector spaces, right? So set theory, uh, maybe I shouldn't call set theory boring, but kind of linear algebra is definitely more successful than set theory. Uh, so whatever, I, I, shouldn't, I shouldn't say that. I should, I should stop waffling. Uh, the category of sets is definitely not as nice as the category of vector spaces. And here's maybe another reason why. So here now are two notions split. I have a left notion, I have a right notion. They're not quite the same. Um, well, they weren't quite the same before anyway, so they were dual, but the space that you would use is, is not the same. So um, what kind of well, what kind of set has a unique map to any other set? It's actually the empty set. So kind of by definition, if you want, the empty set has the empty map to as any other set, and there is no other set with this property. And kind of dually, it's not the empty set, which is kind of the one-point set. There's exactly one map from every set to the one-point set. Obviously, there's just one map. It just sends everything to the one point, right? So there's precisely one map from empty to x, and there's precisely one map from x to the one-point set. The first one is a little bit silly. It's kind of by definition, if you want, what is a map from the empty set to anything anyway? Um, but anyway, so there's precisely one map. And in the converse directions, that's kind of more natural. You can, you can map everything to a point. So you have precisely one map from X to the point. And no other sets have those properties. So we kind of discovered here a notion which is not quite a zero. It's kind of very close to a zero, but not quite. 
And this will kind of define in the end or will be the definition of an initial object on the terminal object that we will see in a second. Right? So what do we had here? We had this object um, in vector spaces. We had zeros, which kind of was, was both. Um, and here we have two different sets, empty set and the one point set, which are still very special sets, obviously. Uh, but you might be unlucky. You might have no zeros at all. And this should be kind of a measure of how algebraic your category is in some sense. So let's me go back to my example of the one cobalt category. So one cop. Um, so no matter what kind of, so this should be kind of, again, the left definition and the right definition. So this should be the, the, the special object. I just chosen one here. You can choose everything you want. You will see that it kind of, there is not a unique map. Why is there no unique map? Well, you can always put infinitely many circles in your, in your diagrams, right? You start somewhere, whatever, you need to go somewhere, whatever, something like this. And you can, there can't be a unique map. You can put as many circles as you want. Um, so no, I, I should have said arbitrary money, not infinitely many. So any kind of finite number of, depends a little how you want to define it, but any kind of finite number of circles will definitely do. So there can't be a unique map and of course, the converse is also true because I can just flip my pictures and I can still put any arbitrary finite number of circles into my pictures. So there is actually no object in this cobalism category which kind of qualifies as a zero, whatever that means. So we kind of had everything. We had now a category uh, which has a zero. We have a category which has kind of pseudo zeros, but two different pseudo zeros. And we had a category which has absolutely no zeros at all in the sense of there's a unique map from it to any other space or a unique map from it to any other space. Um, from, depends a little bit. And this gets us to the definition of uh, initial and terminal and zero objects. An object is called initial if there exists an arrow. So my object is Y, so we're a little bit careful here. If there exists an arrow, a unique arrow from Y to X. And it's called terminal uh, well, you could think of it like a terminal a terminal object, like this little picture with a stole, of course, uh, linked in the description. It's called terminal if you if there's one unique way of getting into there, and that's basically it. So if there exists a unique arrow from X to Y, again, for all X. And it's called a zero object if it's both initial and terminal, right? So that's what happened for k-vector spaces. There was a unique map from zero into X, and there was a unique map from X into zero, so it was both an initial and a terminal object. It was a zero object. In vector spaces, those two notions split. And we had the empty set and the one point set. And in, in cobalisms, there was just no, no object at all satisfying those properties. Right? So um, in cobalisms, there was no object at all. So it actually might happen that they don't exist. Right? Kind of could be that in your category, they actually don't appear. But if they exist, then they're unique up to unique isomorphism. I would show you a more general argument why that is true in another video. But kind of the point here is that these universal type objects are usually very unique. They're kind of, there's one zero and no matter what you do, there will be always one zero. That's basically what it says. Um, and that's kind of what it is. Uh, it's kind of the first step towards definition of a limit we'll see later. So here are two examples. So if you want to think of it like a terminal object is like a sink if you want, everything just goes in with one specific arrow. And um, uh, an initial object is like the source of a category. So um, everything just goes out with one, one specific arrow. And in some sense, well, if you have a, well, something that is initial and terminal, then it is zero. And then you're definitely algebraically easy. And um, kind of the existence of those, it's kind of a measure how algebraically easy a category is. So my favorite category ever, the category of vector spaces, it just has both and they coincide. And it's, it's just it's just the best category ever. Um, kind of <laughs> on the flip side, you have the category of fields, which is really ill-behaved as a category. So category of fields is uh, objects of fields and arrows are fields for homomorphisms. And this is really, really an ill-behaved category. So almost everything I'm going to show you in later videos does not apply to this category. I leave I leave it to you to think about it a little bit, but um, to me, it was very surprising when I first thought about it. I thought kind of fields are nice, but actually fields as a collection is a pretty bad. They're really pretty badly behaved. So fields is a really, really bad category. And here's one instance why it's so bad. It doesn't have any 
nice initial or terminal objects. In contrast to something like groups, which is much better, and certainly in contrast to something like k-vector spaces, which is much, 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 much better than uh, fields as in this sense of being better. Okay, so what I've showed you today is actually the first instance of what we see will be a limit, uh, but we don't need to know that right now. We only know that we kind of generalize the notion of being a zero, right? So what does, does it mean to be a zero in category theory? It means you have a unique map into and a unique map from uh, whatever your zero object is. And you might need to split that. The, the example of sets showed you that, that you might need to kind of split that into initial and the terminal object, and then you just have defined initial and terminal objects. And they satisfy kind of something that you will always see, um, kind of two properties which are crucial. First, they might not exist. Keep that in mind. These things might not exist in your category. In fields, they do not exist. In COP, they do, in corporatisms, they do not exist. Um, second, as soon as they exist, they are basically unique, as unique as it gets. They're unique up to unique isomorphism, which is a pretty cool statement in the end. It kind of tells you that there is exactly one zero, right? So it's unique up to unique isomorphism. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed the video, and I also hope to see you next time.